Welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, a product of Talent 409. I am your host, Colin Cernelia. Thank you for joining us today. Go to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team or organization with their leadership and culture development. This podcast is available on Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Radio.com, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Please consider taking a minute in on Apple Podcasts, giving us a five-star rating and review. Doing this helps other dynamic leaders find us, and it helps us find other dynamic leaders. And don't forget, you can now ask Alexa to play your favorite Apple Podcasts on any Amazon-enabled device. Just say, Alexa, play the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Getting Dynamic Leaders with Colin Cherniglia from Apple Podcasts. On to my featured conversation today where I welcome Tanika Rubin to the show. Tanika is a shooting guard and small forward in the Eurobasket League. She played Division I college hoops at Florida A&M University and in addition to her professional basketball career is a writer and a life winner. During our conversation, Tanika and I talk about how to inspire the next generation facing adversity and facing fears, and she shares knowledge on how to help people chase their dreams. So let's hop right into the full conversation and let's discover our talent altitude. Here is my talk with Tanika Rubin. To the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today on the line with me, I have Tanika Rubin. Tanika, thank you so much for joining the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm actually super excited to talk to you today. <laughs> that is amazing to hear. I love when you are just as excited as I am to talk to you. So let's get right into the conversation. I first want to give you an opportunity to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself. So please tell us, who are you? Uh, so my, my name is Tanika Rubin. I play professional basketball and my passion is just to inspire the next generation and push them towards their dreams. I know what it's like to face adversity and face fear, but still choose to follow my dreams. So I feel like part of my life's purpose is to, to give people hope just by sharing my story. And so I have a blog and I release motivational videos to do that on my social media. Awesome. We are definitely going to spend a lot of time talking about that a little bit later here in the conversation. But first, I want to start. You mentioned professional basketball player. Can you walk us through what your athletic journey has been like? Let's start in high school years. I mean, actually, let's let's go all the way back. I think I read you were you were born in Germany, correct? I was. I was born in Germany. My dad was in the army, so I was uh, I was there until I was. Okay, so talk to me. I'm, I'm just interested. I know the, the army life is already a little bit more stressful, I think, than most of us are accustomed to growing up, at least in terms of you're moving around quite a bit. And I, I'd love to know from your perspective, uh, not even talking about athletics yet, but just the experience that you had growing up and living in different countries, being a part of different cultures and being around different types of people. Do you think that that helped shape the type of person that you are today? Oh, definitely. Um, I was fortunate though, as soon as I turned, I think seven, I stayed in the same place until I graduated. My dad retired in Arizona. Okay. But as far as being around different cultures and, and being exposed to different people, that really shaped the way that I see different opportunities. And I feel like the world was just so much bigger to me as a child, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I can't even, I, I remember, and this is going to sound silly, but I can remember being in high school and sitting outside one night 
trying to imagine what life outside of this little town outside of Syracuse, New York was like. And I, I really couldn't do it. I really hadn't. I mean, I was born in Scranton and a lot of my extended family lives in Scranton. So I had been exposed to one other city, but I really hadn't been exposed too much outside of traveling for athletics, but not enough to say like, hey, I'm living here. I understand that there is a world outside of what I've known for the first 18 years of my life. So for you to have that perspective before you're seven years old, definitely unique (laughs) in its own sense. Another question I have in regards to just your upbringing. So being a part of a military family and having that background, I know I've talked to folks where they have gotten a lot of their attributes and values from their parents, whether it's their dad, their mom, sometimes it's both. Can you talk to us a little bit about maybe what you learned from your dad specifically and things that he passed on to you from his experience? <laughs> yeah. So there was just, well, from both of my parents, but for, I'll speak for my dad because he was in the army. There was an expect an expectation of excellence. Okay. So, and he, he's just a natural born leader, but he expected us to do things a certain way and to communicate a certain way and, and to be strong and, and it really it cultivated something for me on the basketball court as well. And so I took that to basketball. I took it to the classroom. And even though I was considered a problem child, you don't know this, but <laughs> I always knew that the, the mistakes that I made in the classroom or even outside of the classroom, I was going to have to deal with it in a very strict way. So yes. <laughs> so why were you have to tell us now, why, why were you considered a problem child? I, I was just one of those kids, you know, when you go into the classroom, there's like the class is clown. <laughs> they love to, to be the center of attention and, and just didn't really take authority well. I should have. I did. At home, I did. But in the classroom, I wanted to do things my own way sure. and, and have that, that control, I guess you could say. Yeah, just being defiant. Just and up until like in high school, really. But I had those people who reeled me back in because they saw that potential in me mm-hmm. and they and they held me to they held me accountable for it. So I appreciate those people. Yeah, absolutely. Was there a reason why, and obviously some of it is just growing up and and getting more mature, but was there a reason when you got a little bit older that you decided not to be as much of a a rebel or a problem child? (laughs) Yeah, it was a lot. So it had to do with the leaders I talked about, the coaches I had, the teachers who saw potential in me. And to my mom, she, um, I wrote a blog about this actually, but she did a really good job of parenting my potential. And so what I mean by that is, she saw that I liked to write, right? One okay. of the things she did was she saw I liked to write. And so I I remember, I don't remember exactly all the papers she had me write, but she had me write papers when I when I messed up, whatever <laughs> the situation was, she had me write papers. Wow. And I remember her writing, me having, a write, um, having to write a paper on respect. I remember a paper that she had me write on choices. And sometimes I would try to like throw these papers together so she could just, you know, kind of get out of my way. But she would, <laughs> She would hold me accountable and say, you know, this is not the expectation that I'm holding you to. So let's let's try again, right again. And I, I was like, wow, it really it, <laughs> it really helped me out in the long run because it made me think about why I was doing what I was doing. And, and it, it led to change. So sure. So was that in a way, I guess, and I don't know if punishment is really the right word, but it's the only word coming to my mind. Was that her way of punishing you was making you write those papers that obviously she, like you said, put potential parenting. I love that phrase. I've never heard that before, but that, that was a great way, I think, to bring out some of the strengths in you when you were acting out. Absolutely. Yes. Because even though she saw that I was a good writer I, at the time I, I didn't I didn't like to do it I saw it as work so sure absolutely yeah yeah very cool very interesting so then let's talk about when basketball enters the equation did that happen before you settled in Arizona were you exposed to it before that yes um I don't exactly know how but my dad had a basketball in the house and my parents said I just started dribbling it I think I was <laughs> they said like four or five I was really young I just started dribbling it and they saw that I enjoyed the game, and they, they just put it in my face. They bought a basketball goal, and I was outside as as much as I could be. <laughs> it just started from there. I love the game. Very cool. So you obviously have a, a love for the game that started when you were very young. Talk to us about when that love for the game started to turn into something that you took 
very seriously and you knew that you could take it. So obviously you played through high school, but when, when did you get to the point where you said, Hey, I, I think I can make, I can make a game of this in college now. So, um, growing up, I always played with guys and, and talking to a lot of my peers, uh, when female players, we all usually played with guys growing up. Okay. And so I, I remember this guy and he really would push me, like push me to my limits, but we loved playing together. And then it, it kind of took my game to the next level competitively. But my parents always talked to me about the um, opportunities that I could have coming out of high school playing the game. And they just kind of pushed me in the right direction. And when I got to high school, I took it very seriously. Uh, I met a woman. She was coaching the freshman team. And at the time, I didn't really know her too much, but I knew her story. Her name was Coach Trish. And she, we so let's backtrack. I grew up in a small town right in Arizona. It was like a military town slash, I don't know what you want to call it, but it was like a military town. Okay. And we had one high school. And so I didn't know many people who were playing basketball at a high level, but I just knew that I could do it. So when I met her, I found out that she played basketball at the University of Florida. And she also went overseas and played basketball. And so when I found that out, I was like, I have to go and talk to her. And so um, I was playing varsity at the time, but she was coaching freshmen. And so they would practice um, pretty late at night. And so I just sat in their practice and waited for her. And after she was done, I went up to her like really eager and told her, you know, this is what I want to do. I have this dream. And she was very honest with me. She was like, okay, this is what you want to do. This is the work. It's going to take you a lot of work. And so she was kind of like a mentor in my life. And then eventually she became my coach which was a good, it was a challenge for me and a challenge for her because like I told you, I was a, <laughs> I was a trouble student. But she, man, she played such a huge role in showing me the possibilities that I have with basketball. Is she still somebody that you are close to today? Somebody that is a mentor or even maybe a friend at this point? Yeah, absolutely. We, we still keep in touch. We don't talk as much as we used to, but man, she... I still hit her up. She hits me up and, and we have those, those moments where it's like, do you remember this? Yes. I, <laughs> I remember. So that's awesome that you've been able to cultivate that type of relationship for many years now and just stay so close to somebody that was so instrumental towards yes. your success and your development. So you decide that you want to tackle this dream that you had talked about and you ultimately end up at FAMU, which is Florida Art Agricultural and Mechanical University. How do we end up there? Oh, man. So going through high school, I was, I was a pretty good player. And I thought that it was just going to be like the straight road. I wanted to play D1 basketball. That was my, my thing. But once I got to my junior year, the summer of my junior year, I ended up tearing my ACL. Okay. And so I had these schools looking at me. And so I ended up missing my whole senior year of, of high school. And then they kind of just fell back a little bit. So I made the decision to go to the junior college route. So I went to a junior college in Arizona called Glendale Community College. And I spent two years there. And it was very challenging. I tell people if they're not familiar with junior college, it tests you to see if that's really what you want to do, if the sport that you're playing is really what you want to play. Because first of all, you, you don't have all the resources that you would have at the next level. And sure. That's the first thing. The second thing is the people around you aren't really all focused on the same thing. So a lot of my teammates were just there because, you know, they, they just wanted to do something or spend their time. And so while my goal was to get to that next level, a lot of people around me were just kind of hanging out and having fun. And I had to have that tunnel vision in order to stay focused on what it really was that I wanted to do. And, and so after spending two seasons at Glendale, I ended up going on a visit to Florida A&M University. And it was the only visit I went to, but I fell in love with the school. I fell in love with the culture and the, the coaches and the team and everything they stood for. So that's where I ended up. I can only think off the top of my head, I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who has suffered an injury like you do and had the misfortune to, you missed your entire senior year, like you talked about. The only other person I know of that is Penn State's wide receiver, KJ Hamler. And okay. I know, I know, so KJ's story is a little bit different because KJ plays 
a revenue building sport and Penn State put an offer out to him before he tore his ACL. They kept that offer to him because they can afford to do that a little bit more than, and and it's the unfortunate differences in some of these sports. And it's not just a male, female gender type thing. It it can be with college baseball. It can be with some of the, the male sports as well. But in general, I'm curious to know, what your mindset was during that time period. Cause I'd have to imagine that not just from a competition standpoint where you're used to playing and now you're sitting on the bench, but having some people who were looking at you and, and thinking about those opportunities that you could have had and maybe weren't having because of that injury, that had to be a difficult time period in your life. Uh, super difficult. I was, for me, it was like the first real adversity that I faced on this journey. And so it kind of, at first, it turned into like a little depressive state. Okay. And so I was thinking, oh, it's over. There's, <laughs> there's no chance from here. You know, there's no way I can can do what I what I set out to do. But again, there's those people who are around me who just kind of rallied together and, and pushed me in the, the right direction because they saw that potential in me. And so there were days where I'd be at practice and I would just be like so sad. <laughs> and my teammates would just come around me. they they speak positively to me and like hug me and everything. And the same thing with my parents. I, I remember vividly this one time where I was sitting in my room and my dad came and knocked on my door and I was just sad. He started talking to me. You know how it is when you're sad and someone talks to you and then you start crying. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to cry, but you start crying. And so him and my mom came in there and they were just motivating me and, and pushing me. And they were like, you know, it's It's okay. You're at a place right now that you didn't think you were going to be, but this is a, a test and it's opportunity for you to grow. And that's exactly what happened. So being injured is one of the better things that have happened to me because it made me focus on taking care of my body. It made me learn about the parts of the body that I wouldn't have been focused on and and weightlifting and making sure that I am doing the right things when I get healthy. And so it helped me out a lot. If you don't mind me asking, how long has it been since the injury? It was in 2011. So that's when I, yeah, 2011. So Eight years. Okay. Yeah, eight years. Okay. So eight years, you're still playing. You're playing professionally now. Yeah. T- talk to us about how you, I- I'm sure it's gotten easier over time, obviously, where maybe you don't think about the injury as often, but especially in the beginning, it must've been difficult thinking, oh, if I take one wrong step, it's going to happen again. I'm going to tear it again. And so I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about that aspect, but I also love, you mentioned, talked about building up the strength around the knee and and just focusing on that. How do you keep that strong? And I'm assuming that you haven't had a serious setback since that initial injury. Right. So falling in love with weightlifting kind of made sure that I felt strong enough and felt confident enough to play the game. And so as, um, as a pro, I've not had those feelings of, oh, is it going to tear again? Now in some places I do play, the, the ground is harder. So like every time we play in the United States, we're always playing on hardwood. But sometimes in Spain, we may have played on like a floor. I don't know if it's concrete, but it's just like not what we're used to playing on. And so my knees may react to it. And then I'm like, oh, gosh, I have to go and and make sure that I'm uh, recovering well and recovering better and taking care of my body. But uh, I've not had the feelings of that it's going to tear again. So do you think the recovery aspect is arguably the most important part of staying healthy, like even more important than building up that strength again? Absolutely. And especially I'm 26. So I don't know if that's old, but it's not, it's not, it's not 19. So, <laughs> so I have to make sure I'm always stretching me and my teammate here. We're talking about how we have to roll out our muscles and, and do that extra stretching and yoga and resting and all that kind of stuff. And I will say that recovery is important. It's the more important at this stage. Very cool. Okay. Uh, One of the things I want to touch on, you mentioned one of the reasons that you ended up at FAMU, excuse me, was because of the culture fit with the program. Can you talk to us a little bit specifically what that culture was like and what really drew you to that opportunity? Yeah. So when when I got to FAMU, it's it's FAMU. FAMU. That's much easier. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's okay. Uh, once once I got there, I just saw that the team was like family oriented and I didn't have that 
exactly at the junior college level. And the reason why is because we all lived in different places in junior college. So we weren't like on campus and a dorm. We lived in different apartments or some of the, some of my teammates lived at home. Sure. And so seeing everyone together and supporting each other and helping each other. So some people didn't have cars and just seeing everyone rally around each other to be a family and work towards one goal. That, that really got me excited to go there. Very cool. All right. So when now I'm speeding up the process here a little bit, because I want to spend a good amount of time on what you're doing currently, but talk about, so you have your collegiate career. Did you have any aspirations to stay in the United States to play or was it, you definitely wanted to go overseas? What, What was that transition period like for you? So ever since I was a little kid, I've always said I wanted to play basketball overseas. That was just my thing. But if the opportunity ever presented itself to stay home, then I think now I would probably take advantage of it. But I I love being overseas and experiencing different cultures and different foods I love to eat in <laughs> different languages. So, yeah. Is that really one of the biggest draws to keep doing it? I'd have to imagine. So you got you settled in the United States when you were, I think you said seven, correct? So right. seven, and then you play basketball all through college. So you're in the United States for what, another 12, 13 years, and now you're back overseas again. So is it more of what you get outside of basketball in addition to obviously getting to play, but is it what you get outside of basketball that draws you to keep taking those opportunities because it it must still be hard to leave family behind and leave friends behind that we're here in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely an experience that it adds to you because of what you experience outside of basketball. So my first experience overseas was in London and it wasn't as a pro, it was actually um I was attending a university and they were paying for my masters as like so I was like a student athlete again. Okay. So I was playing basketball and I was attending the University of East London. And that was really cool because I got a chance to learn from um, at professors from different parts of the world. So I had Indian professor, you know, had some British professors, I had some professors from the Middle East. And it was it was really cool just to hear. I guess you can hear from hearing their experiences and their input in business, which is what I study from different aspects of their culture. Okay. And so what I think is normal in the United States <laughs> and what I learned at FAMU's business school, it's not the same thing that I learned at the business school in, in London. It was really, really cool. Hey everyone, Christine here to talk about a sponsor of this show, my own business, Sweat With Stods. Head over to sweatwithstods.com to get the workout that suits your needs, whether you work out at home, in the gym, or you're brand new to fitness, there's something for everyone. Podcast listeners also get a special discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout, so be sure to head on over there after this. Thanks, and back to the show. Business is your educational background, and you're playing basketball now, but you're also obviously trying to impact, as you mentioned earlier, the next generation and doing some of that work. Let's talk about, let's finish up with basketball first and then let's move towards more of the business side. What are the basketball aspirations moving forward? How long do you want to keep playing? Do you want to stay overseas? Do you want to try and get back to the States? What does that look like? That's a great question. I, I want to play as long as possible, okay. right? As long as my knees will let me play, I want to <laughs> play. Um, as far as staying overseas or, or going back to the States, I really am just open to the best opportunity for me. So the way that I kind of live my life is I do the best that I can where I'm at. And then whatever doors open, you know, I trust that it, it it's for me. And so I just see what's best for me and make decisions that way. Coming back over to the United States side, it's not really a, a big concern for me. But I like you said, I do miss my family and I would like to, to have them at my games and, and see me play more often. Definitely. Do you think one last point on this? Do you think that in some ways you as women are trailblazing for people in general? So let me tell you the reason that I'm asking this. You are taking opportunities overseas, but you are also taking opportunities that make the most sense for you. You're not limiting yourself towards one or the other. So if you have an opportunity that 
that seems like it works in the States, you'll take it. But if there's something overseas that's better, you'll go for that. And I feel like in general, and I know it's bad to do this sometimes, but I feel like in general, women have been very good about taking those opportunities that are good for them because unfortunately in the States, the opportunities usually aren't better. Absolutely. So in some ways you're being forced to take those opportunities, whether it's a monetary thing or just an opportunity to build a skill set. But I'm really interested to hear what your perspective is on this because I think it's starting to take hold with men too. And I just saw that there is a baseball player that, that I follow, Adam Jones. He played probably 15 seasons or so in the major leagues, and he just took a big deal in Japan. I just saw it two days ago, I think it was. Wow. And he says in the – it's an Instagram post, and he's talking about the opportunity they really wanted him. He's 37 years old. In the major leagues in America, that's considered old. But in Japan yeah. – he was wanted. He, they they wanted to bring him over. So he took that opportunity. I don't know that men have been traditionally doing that for a long time, but do you think because women have been doing this for so long that men are now starting to see that just because maybe they don't have a chance in America, it doesn't mean that they can't continue their career somewhere else. Absolutely. Like you said, women have kind of been forced in that direction. And while some of us want to be overseas, a, a lot of women really would instead rather be in the United States, but it's all about not limiting yourself. And, and I think also it is pushing more organizations in the United States to try to create more paths for women. So what I've seen yes. in the last couple of years is more teams and more leagues where women can play in, in the summer that aren't the WNBA. And so I think that's really powerful. And in terms of men doing it, I think it's really cool, especially with, the rules surrounding the NCAA and, and all of the, the friction there where they say, you know what, I want to make my own decision. I'm going to go this route. And I think it, it really putting the power back in the hands of the athlete, which is very important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for player empowerment. Let's, let's go for it. So yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Okay. Let's switch over to the business side because I know this is just as important to you. And if you're healthy, it's probably going to be the longer portion of your life. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So how, how did you get interested in business in the first place? It was obviously something that you studied in school, but where did that initial interest come from? So when I was in high school, it actually happened when, when I got injured. And so up until the time that I got injured, my identity was around basketball. I saw myself only as a basketball player. And if there were other opportunities for me to do anything else, I would shut it down because, you know, that was my identity. But once I got hurt, I had more time to kind of look around and see what else I'm good at or what else I'm interested in. And I had this teacher and she was <laughs> she was like, Tanika, I want you to be in my class. And I was like, okay, what class is it? And she said it was a marketing class. And so she explained it to me a little bit. I, up until then, I had really no background or knowledge in marketing. But I, I joined her class. And from there, she just taught me so much about how I could use what I like to do or what I love and share it with the world and potentially profit from it. And so it was really cool. I joined a, a marketing club called DECA and it, it enhanced my communication skills because I was able to take something that I believed in and something that I knew about and communicate it to people so that they could see my vision or my passion as well. Was it around that same time period where your passion for writing started to come out too? Because obviously you didn't like it when you were being forced <laughs> to write when you were a kid, but when, when did the writing piece of it all fall into place? Um, the writing, seriously, uh, it's, it started a little bit after I was in college when that happened, but okay. I still knew that I could write. So it was like I used that skill as well in that class because we had to do a business plan and, and all kinds of things like that. So now you've been able to pair those two things together, essentially. And you mentioned your blog a few times and the ways that you are inspiring the next generation. You're helping them face their adversity, face their fears, and really helping them chase their dreams. Let's dive deeper into what all that means. On the surface, it sounds, it sounds amazing, but I'd love to know a little bit more specifically about what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to inspire the next generation. So, yeah, so when I'm at home, 
um, in the summertime usually, I spend a lot of time with like high school age kids. And so when I'm, I'm a youth mentor where I live in Florida, but this last summer was actually one of the biggest summers for me in growth and in terms of how I see myself as a youth mentor. I, do, are you familiar with like summer camps up in the North area, like yeah. the Jewish camps and everything? Yeah, yeah, there? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I spent the eight weeks in a camp called Camp Starlight. Okay. And I, I joined the camp this past summer, not really knowing what to expect or what to come out of it, but knowing that, you know, I was going to be like a basketball coach or, or whatever. And it, it really opened my eyes to, um, to how I can impact them. Right. So I worked with the 16 year olds. I was a basketball coach, but I saw that I relate to them in a certain way, especially like the troubled ones or the ones that come in and they're kind of like, I really don't want to be here. Or the ones who, who are are maybe struggling with their identity, which, which a lot of kids are right now. It's just like a terrible time for them in terms of like comparing themselves to other people. And it's just, it kind of broke my heart to see that a lot of the kids who were there were so talented, not just basketball. So it's kind of camp that, that deals with all kinds of activities. But to see that they were so talented and had so much potential, but they couldn't see it in themselves. And so being there at Camp Starlight, it showed me that I know how to pinpoint that potential in them, but also know how to pull it out of them by speaking life into them. So it was it was really it was a powerful time this last summer. Yeah, very cool. What are some of the I guess maybe it's more interesting to you or maybe they are more impactful when you're writing blog posts or when you're writing inspirational messages, how do you determine what type of topics you are going to write about? That's a really good question. So a lot of what I do is I just take, you know, the notes function in your phone. Yes. I take a lot of notes and it just like whenever (laughs) I'm just going through life And this last summer when I was at camp, I took a a lot of notes based on what I saw or how I interacted with people or even what I learned because it really is such a great organization. I pulled a lot from how they built their culture. So I take notes and then I'll look through it and I'll say, you know, that's a pretty cool thing to write about. Let's write about that. And I'll just sit there, brainstorm a little bit and then go in. One of the challenges that you mentioned (laughs) that, that we have as coaches, as adults, when we're working with youth these days, especially at the teenage level, when their understanding of how to use social media is at an all time high there. One of the challenges is comparing yourselves to other people and, and not understanding that just because somebody has a great post doesn't mean that things are all that great with them and, maybe they're just better at taking pictures than you are, but that doesn't mean that they're happier. There's a lot of different factors, obviously. And I I will say admittedly on my end, this is something I struggle with being able to help with on a consulting basis because a, I didn't really grow up with social media. It didn't start until Facebook, I think launched my senior year of high school. So it wasn't really around when, when I was growing up and B I'm just really not that type of person anyway. So it's not something that I ever personally experienced. So it's hard to me connect. It's hard for me to connect in that way. So when coaches ask me if I'm working with, with, and it's across the board, (laughs) when I'm working with the youth, they're on their phones, they're posting about this, they care more about getting what they did on their phone out to the world than they do about the actual result of what they just did. And that can be a whole different conversation, I guess. But my question is, how do you help those kids that maybe have identified that they're struggling because of social media, because of comparing themselves to others? Like they've gotten to that point where they realize that it's being of detriment to them, but they're not sure what to do. Have you been able to actually help people through those times? Yeah. And it's, it's always tough because when you're talking to a child, you have them there with you. But then when you go back, they go back to school. Now they're back in that environment where everything is, is very superficial. Mm-hmm. So for me, I remember um, it was two years ago and there was a young lady that I was mentoring and she was dealing with some of the things that you just mentioned, but uh, she was also dealing with some other like identity issues. And so for me, it was just spending more time with her. And the more that I spoke to her, 
then the more that she was able to, to see. So we would go out for coffee or we would go and I would take my younger siblings with her and we would go shopping or whatever. But the more that you speak positively, positivity, it gets it gets down into their their mental or whatever you want to call it. But it's not easy. I would say that it's not easy. <laughs> it hasn't been easy. One, one of the things about being at this camp this last summer is that the, the kids were not allowed to have their phones. And so wow. there were certain times where they could um, talk to their families, but for the most part, they're not allowed to have their phones. And I saw that really help with the culture of the place because for the most part, kids would be on their phone, you know, they'd be scrolling through, looking to see what their friends were doing during their summer breaks, but they had the opportunity to focus in on the different activities that they were, you know, getting an opportunity to experience. So. How long was that time period for, for the camp? Like how long were they without their phones? <laughs> Seven weeks, actually. Wow. Seven weeks. And I didn't know how it was going to go. I was like a little skeptical about it. But those kids have been going to that camp since they were seven years old. So it's a camp from seven all the way to 16 and has like over 500 kids. And so they do a really good job of, of separating it and making sure, you know, you have some kids that try to sneak their phone in. They get caught, of course, and get a little, <laughs> get in trouble a little bit. But for the most part, the kids, um, it enhanced their communication skills and their ability to really connect with people because with like this social media era, and I love social media, I use it, but I think it all depends on how you use it. You know, mm -hmm. with this era, it's really limited people with being able to connect with people and listen to them and, and really understand them. Yeah, absolutely. And what are some of the biggest differences that you see with the kids? Like what, what do they do to fill their time? that they normally would be on their phone scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, whatever it is. What did you notice were some of the things that they were doing to, to fill that time otherwise? Talking to each other. Um, the way the camp is set up, actually, they really have them busy all, like the whole day is filled with different activities. And so um, the, the beginning part of the day was actually to set up like school kind of. So like where I was a basketball coach, um, one of my friends was like a tennis director. And then you have, all the soccer and all the arts and crafts, whatever. And so they put them through and it's like 45 minutes and you can try these different activities. And then this, the last part of the day, you can choose your own activity, like the sixth period, you can choose your own activity. And then after that, there are like concerts they put on and different other, other kind of big events they put on during the day and going into the night so that they really don't have time to miss their phone. So um, they're just learning and experiencing different things so that they can grow as people. That is so interesting. I'm honestly, I'm yeah. amazed. <laughs> that... Me too. I really am. And I experienced it. I'm still amazed. <laughs> yeah. Seven weeks. I, I, I mean, maybe yeah. I was, I was thinking you were going to say a week. Honestly, I was like, all right, I, I could see a week. Like they could, seven they could weeks. give it up, but wow. Seven weeks. That's enough to build like some serious healthy habits when it comes yeah. to, to that. And I saw that and I saw that with the kids, like, in the beginning of camp, you see that they're kind of like itching for their phones or they, they're still do they're used to doing things the way that they were doing them throughout the whole year. But then at the last day of camp, you see people crying, there's tears because they don't want to leave in the bond that was created. It was, it was really like the, the most amazing experience I've ever had. Seriously. Wow. That is super powerful. It just, yeah. wow. I wish, I wish there was a way that we could, like especially in sports, I think it would be really cool in at the college level maybe to be able to set up these quote unquote camps. But like, remember, have you ever seen Remember the Titans? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so so you know when when they go to Gettysburg and they spend like a week there, and it's it's a whole like getting to know each other and team building and, and culture building before culture became a thing back in the <laughs> so uh, but I think it would be really interesting at the college level like specifically to be able to get different programs and say hey take those because a lot of like say say they come back early for the summertime like a lot of those programs start before classes start so take those first four yeah. weeks go stay somewhere it doesn't need to be like in the middle of nowhere but go stay somewhere off campus take your phones put them away and really yeah. grow like that would be such an interesting experiment I wonder if 
I wonder if I could get anybody to do that. I'll have to look into it, but <laughs> that would really change a lot of things for programs. And I think they probably win more, you know, because you right. have that trust, you have that camaraderie and that togetherness. Yeah. yeah. Everything that coaches constantly relay to me that they struggle with could be figured out in that four week period. And and then you'd have that momentum to build on for the rest of the year. Like, yes, you have to come back to reality. And yes, phones are a part of living. You have to be able to communicate with people. Like it's almost impossible not to use them these right. days, but you can certainly, I think, find ways to fill that time, like you said, and really get yes. to know each other and really get to grow as a team, whether that's the type of camp that, <clears throat> excuse me, you were at, or it's something that maybe isn't as serious as the college athletics. It can, I'm sure, be done at a yeah. smaller scale, but wow, absolutely, really, really interesting. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. One of the interesting topics that I want to make sure we talk about. I love this phrase. Another one of your great phrases that you used today in our conversation was the expectation of excellence. Yeah. Talk to me first about what that specifically means. Can you break that down a little bit more? Yes. The expectation of excellence is, well, there's so many ways I could explain it, but it's just really holding yourself and holding others to a higher level. And so once you have that expectation that we're going to do everything at a high level, then that means that the little things that you do are going to tie into that. So, for example, for me being a professional athlete and I know that I have to be at you know the top of my game, that means that no one's going to tell me to wake up in the morning and go work out. No one's going to tell me that I have to eat right. And especially being over here overseas where it's more lax, you know, in college, um, the coaches are more hands-on, the trainers are more hands-on, and they kind of are telling you the way that you need to live so that you can perform the best. Sure. Having a higher expectation of excellence means that I have to have that self-discipline to do it myself, right? And that comes from a place of, like, what's my why? What's my reason to do it? Because I was talking to my dad, actually, the other day, and I was t- we were talking about how the love for your sport it's good, but it's it's not going to be enough once you hit that adversity. You have to have a reason why you do it and to hold yourself at, at that expectation of excellence all the time. Have you been able to identify what your why is? I'd love to know what is of equal or maybe more important to you than the game of basketball at this point. Yeah, it really ties back into what I feel like my purpose is, and it's in sharing that hope and that that drive to um, help young people believe in their dreams. So I'll give you a story, actually. I love stories. So <laughs> awesome. I was, um, it was my junior college. I was in my junior college, uh, my first or second year, I want to say, but I was walking from my car to my apartment door and I saw a young boy, like eight or nine years old. I think he was, but he had on like basketball shorts and like a Jersey or a shirt or something. I can't remember exactly what he was wearing, but just, the kind of person I am, I like to start conversations. So I was like, hey, little man, you play basketball? And he was like, yeah, I, I like to, but my mom can't afford to put me on a team. And I was like, oh, I didn't expect him to say that. But at the same time, it made me realize that I'm super privileged. And at any time that I wanted to be on a team, my parents were always able to get me on there and, and pay for my shoes or just the little things I thought were little, but actually big to some people, sure. to, to a lot of people. Sure. And so that ties into my why and why I do it because at some point I want to be able to provide resources and empower young people to be able to chase their dreams or do whatever is in their heart to do. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that really quickly to end the expectation of excellence, that part of this conversation. So you uphold that as an individual. Do you think that Leading by example is something that your teammates that pick up that because you do it, that they want to have that same type of expectation, or is that something that you need to coach a little bit and verbalize a little bit to other people? I think at this point that I'm at, um, I'm leading by example pretty well. When I was in college, I could have done a little bit better of knowing what it looked like to lead and knowing what a leader really meant because a lot of times they put you in that position as 
as a team captain Mm -hmm. and not really tell you the expectation of what a leader looks like, you know, just because you're the best player on the team doesn't mean that you're a leader. And so I think now as I've been able to grow and learn about what leadership really looks like, I've been able to to lead by example and, and kind of bring up the people around me. Very cool. Awesome. Tanika, if people want to touch base with you, social media, email, anything like that, is there a way to easily connect with you? Yes, you can find me most of the mostly I'm on Instagram. That's where my presence is really felt Instagram on Tanika Rubin, which is spelled my name, Tanika Rubin, T A N E K A R U B I N. And Facebook is the exact same, and Twitter is the exact same, Tanika Rubin. Awesome. Check out the show notes. I will put those in there for anyone listening. Easy reference. If you do want to check out more of what Tanika is doing or get in touch, I definitely encourage it. This has been an awesome conversation. But before I let you go, the show is called Dynamic Leaders. And it's obvious why you are on the show as a dynamic leader. But I love to give my guests an opportunity to shout out somebody that has an influence in their life, somebody that stands out from a leadership capacity. Do you have somebody that you want to give a shout out to today? Yeah, actually, I have so many leaders that I could, but I'm actually, I want to pay homage to someone who is no longer here. So okay. when I was at FAMU, um, the FAMU Business School, there was a man named Dr. Clyde Ashley, and he was one of the most dynamic leaders I've ever met. He he really held people to that expectation of excellence that I was talking about, and he did not let anyone be average. He was, <laughs> he was, he was one of those tough guys, but he actually had us recite this mantra every time we would enter into his classroom. He would have a stand up and we would have to say, no excuses acceptable. No amount of effort is adequate until proven effective. Should I say it again? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's definitely, let's, <laughs> let's reiterate it for people. He said, no excuses acceptable. No amount of effort is adequate until proven effective. And that was it was really powerful for me. Like at the time, I didn't really appreciate saying it because I'm like, it's early, you know, but at, as I moved on forward, I said, wow, that's important. Especially if I want to do what I think I want to do at a high level, I have to understand that there is no excuse and there is no reason why I should think that the bare minimum is acceptable. And so well, he passed away a few years after I graduated, but I just, I feel so blessed to be a part of his legacy. So, yeah. That's an awesome shout out. Thank you so much for that. And thank you again for hopping on. I know you had to be flexible. I had to be flexible to do this with the time difference. So I certainly appreciate that. But I really did enjoy this. You brought so many interesting perspectives to the conversation that people are really going to enjoy when they get a chance to listen to this. So I can't thank you enough for taking time to hop on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure to speak with you today.